Inside each of us lies an astonishing power. A power so elemental, so vital, the world depends on it, thrives on it. That power is human potential. The ability to create vibrant futures. It's a student's potential to become a leader, an inventor, a healer. The researcher's potential to cure cancer, to forge new discoveries, to create a sustainable world. It's her potential to reduce hunger, his determination to build a stronger workforce, and their power to lift the human spirit and make it soar. When we invest in people, we invest in the belief that together, we can change lives and move communities forward. Ohio State has always championed people and their potential. Here, brilliance and compassion intertwine. Hearts and minds connect to create lasting, positive change. With courage and optimism, we confront the complexities of today and the unknowns of tomorrow. Through time and change, we continually advocate for those who improve our world. Whiteboards and computers, they don't transform students into leaders. The people who use them do. Buildings of metal and glass don't make dynamic discoveries. The people inside of them do. Paths of brick and stone don't build stronger communities. The people who travel them do. You do. We do. Human potential is the world's greatest resource. And when we work together to champion this potential, anything is possible. Together, we are champions for students, researchers, artists, visionaries, and communities. Together, we are champions for all. And together, we move forward. Hello everyone and welcome on behalf of the College of Food, Agricultural and Environmental Sciences to the CFAES Time and Change Alumni Webinar Series. I want to welcome back those who have joined previous webinars in this series and welcome those joining for the first time. I'm Amy Jo Bachman and I serve as the Director of Alumni Engagement and Annual Giving for CFAES. Before we begin the webinar, I'd like to share just a few housekeeping items. All microphones are muted and videos are turned off. This session is being recorded and will be shared after today's webinar. Live closed captioning is being provided. Turn on closed captions in the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. Use the Q&A feature to submit, to submit questions throughout the webinar and use the chat feature to introduce yourself to other attendees. When using the chat feature, be sure to select all panelists and attendees for messages. CFAES is a cornerstone college of The Ohio State University. And as you learn from the video, human potential is the most valuable resource that we possess. CFAES is proud of our alumni and the great work that they do to lead food, agricultural and environmental industries. I'm thrilled to introduce an outstanding alumna and the moderator of our alumni panel today. Dr. Annie Specht is an Associate Professor of Agricultural Communication in the Department of Agricultural Communication, Education and Leadership here at The Ohio State University. She teaches courses in publication, production and design, feature writing and data visualization. Her research interests include popular media portrayals of agriculture, public perceptions of food and fiber issues, and visual communication. Dr. Specht is a two-time alumna of the College of Food, Agricultural, and Environmental Sciences, receiving a Bachelor of Science degree in Agriculture and a Master of Science degree in Agricultural and Extension Education. Thanks for moderating our panel today, Dr. Specht. Thanks, Sammy Jo. As an alumna and a donor to CFAES, it is a pleasure to be here. Welcome everyone to the CFAES Time and Change webinar series. 
Today, we will discuss policy in food, agricultural, and environmental industries with three exceptional CFAS alumni. First, I'd like to introduce Ellen Crivella. As DNV GL's Senior Vice President for Project Development and Engineering, Ellen manages the offshore wind team, engineering team, environmental and permitting services section, and energy assessment section. Her team of nearly 100 scientists, engineers, and technologists assist the, the renewables industry, starting with early phase site characterization, all through project development activities, and continued into financing and operations. Prior to her current role, Ellen was DNV GL's Senior Manager for Strategy and Business Development. And previous to this, she held the role of DNV GL's Global Head of Practice for Environmental and Permitting Services. In 2016, she was recognized by Women in Renewable Industries and Sustainable Energy with their annual leadership award. She holds both bachelor's and master's degrees from The Ohio State University. Thanks for joining us today, Ellen. Our second panelist is Joe Schultz. Joe serves as the Democratic Staff Director for the U.S. Senate Committee on Agriculture, Nutrition, and Forestry under the leadership of the top-ranking Democrat, Senior De uh, Senator Debbie Stabenow. As Staff Director, Joe manages the legislative priorities of Senator Stabenow and leads the committee's team of professional staff. During the writing of the 2018 Farm Bill, Joe led negotiations on behalf of Senate Democrats, resulting in a bipartisan bill with more Senate votes than any Farm Bill in history. Previously, Joe served as the committee's chief economist and led the policy development of farm commodity programs and federal crop insurance during the 2014 Farm Bill. Prior to joining the Ag Committee staff, Joe served as a legislative aide to U.S. Senator Sherrod Brown. Joe grew up on a fourth generation family farm in Western Ohio. He earned his bachelor's degree in agribusiness and applied economics from The Ohio State University and his master's degree in applied economics from Cornell University. Joe, thank you for sharing your expertise with us today. And last but not least, we have Melanie Wilt. With one boot in the barn and one stiletto in the city, our third panelist, Melanie, founded Shiftology, a full service PR agency specializing in the biosciences. She has built an award-winning team of communication professionals who work to help organizations and individuals speak with their authentic voice. Melanie started her career in communication at an international horticulture association, which is now American Hort. Since then, she has served as the communication director and chief of markets for the Ohio Department of Agriculture, and she received the Young Professional Achievement Award from the Ohio State University College of Food, Agricultural, and Environmental Sciences. She loves every minute of sharing her passion for the farm and communication with her family through their involvement in 4-H and time together on their 40-acre farm. She and her husband, Gabe Kelly, have three children. Melanie also serves as a Clark County Commissioner to make a positive impact in her community. Thanks for being with us today, Melanie, and welcome to all of our panelists. Thank you. All right, so as we begin uh, the conversation with these alumni leaders, please feel free to submit any questions in the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. We're going to do our best to get to all of our questions, but we may not be able to get to all of them before 3 p.m. All right, um, let's get started. And to start things off, everyone, I want to ask, uh, what were some of your favorite activities that you were involved in during your time as students in CFAES? And Melanie, I'm gonna kick it off with you. Okay, well, I absolutely loved my time in Agricultural Communicators of Tomorrow, or ACT. Um, some of my best memories are actually travel with that organization and the people that I met all over the country, some of whom are among my best friends today. Some were Ohio State students at the time and some were students at other universities that had AgCom programs uh, across the country. One of the opportunities that we got to have uh, was the U.S. Agricultural Communicators Congress, which was a group of American ag editors and livestock publications. And uh, we had the opportunity to go to Washington, DC. They used to hold this event every four years and ACT was invited to attend one of those years. It was always held during an elect a presidential election year. Mm -hmm. And we had the opportunity to go and hear then uh, USDA Ag Secretary Dan Glickman 
and meet President Clinton at the time. So he was the first of three different presidents that I had the opportunity to meet. And I wouldn't have had that chance uh, if it wasn't for Agricultural Communicators of Tomorrow. So great experiences there and other experiences all hold for uh, conversation over drinks sometime. Sounds good. All right, Joe, how about you? Well, um, uh, one, thanks for having us uh, here, Annie and uh, Amy Jo. Um, I, I think many of the folks who would have known me in college uh, probably knew that I spent more time in kind of outside organizations and after class activities maybe than I spent in class. Um, and uh, it was great. Uh, I actually had the chance to meet uh, one of our other panelists, Ellen Cravella and her husband, Dan, uh, through kind of student activities. Um, you know, I remember that uh, on the first week on campus and uh, I, was, I was in the dorms and somebody grabbed me and said, uh, Joe, we're, we're headed to an ag ed society meeting. And I said, well, I don't even know if I wanna be an ag teacher. And they said, it doesn't matter. You're gonna go meet people. We're going over, over across the river and we're gonna go to an ag ed society meeting. And from that first week, um, really the, the organizations and activities, um, ag ed society, um, I met Ellen through a great uh, group called Ohio Staters Incorporated doing service projects. Um, I was a member of the fraternity, which at the time was called ATZ, which is now Farmhouse. Um, and, and this is where I met my best friends uh, who are still my best friends today. So um, those activities, um, uh, I wanna say that, that classes were important, uh, but meeting the people and the lifelong friendships really started with all those student act activities and organizations. Excellent. And Ellen. Yes, thanks for having me. And uh, so nice to see you all. Um, like Joe, I spent a lot of time in student organizations and student activities. And uh, when I came to the university as a freshman, I had the opportunity to be in the first class of Mount Scholars. And so that was a, a leadership group, a scholars program that was really instrumental in shaping a lot of my views and really helping me understand that I could be a leader and uh, understand what type of leader you know, I, I wanted to be. And so I actually had the pleasure then when I was in graduate school, I was a graduate associate within the School of Environment and Natural Resources. And at that time they were starting their uh, ENR scholars program. And so I had the pleasure of helping in some of the early days brainstorm and come up with some of the ideas for that program. So uh, it was just a, a great experience and I learned a lot and got to then translate that into a way to give back uh, when I was in graduate school participating in the development of that program. And I'm, I'm so happy to see that it's going strong still today. I think one of my favorite things about moderating these, uh, these panels has been getting to see all of the connections that people have even years after they've graduated. So it's really great to hear all of that. Um, and I love my dramatic lighting change as the lights turned out in my office. Um, so moving on to your professional experiences, how has policy in food, agricultural, and environmental industries changed over the last 20 to 30 years? This is a really small question to answer. Um, and how do you foresee it changing in the future? Um, so Joe, I'm gonna ask you to, uh, to begin with this one. Uh, well, sure. And first, I just, I, I'm so lucky because I get the chance to work on farm and food policy uh, for, for a living and it's great. And I, I live and work in Washington, DC, but I get to think and work with people thinking about this very question, Annie. And so I appreciate it. Um, uh, I think the, the big changes that we see and that certainly maybe even more than the last 20, 30 years is the role that technology has played in agriculture in our food system and how different agriculture looks today than it did 50 years ago. And trying to imagine what does agriculture look 10, 20 years from now? Uh, and it's hard for me to, to know uh, because things are moving so fast. Um, the other big thing that I see has, has changed are consumers and their interest in agriculture and farming and where their food is coming from and production methods. And, you know, that's uh, in some ways a challenge, but really also an opportunity for a lot of our farmers and producers 
um, to talk about farming and talk about agriculture and do some education, but also kind of bring them into the world a little bit and, and pull back the curtain. And sometimes that makes folks more uncomfortable uh, than it should be because I think consumers just wanna know. Uh, they wanna understand where their food comes from. Um, as we look forward, I see that the role of environment and climate change um, as another really big driver of our policies. And I think, and I'm, a, I'm an optimist here, I think in a really positive way, uh, because I think that we can see that agriculture can provide a lot of the solutions uh, to issues like climate change, uh, issues like water quality. And so I'm, I'm very kind of optimistic that ag is going to be a very positive uh, contributor in, in terms of how we see solving some of these problems that we're facing in the environment and, and climate space. Absolutely. And, and Joe, we actually see it right now with renewable energy policy and the way that we cite renewable energy projects. You know, that is my field uh, and my team, and I work very hard to make sure that we are complying with all of the regulatory requirements out there, everything from the Bald and Golden Eagle Protection back to the uh, local local requirements that maybe soil and water conservation districts have. But at the end of the day, siting a wind farm on a rancher's land or a farmer's land is really a very compatible land use. Uh, and in fact, in the state of Ohio alone, we know that there are lease payments that go along with these facilities when we put them on uh, farmers and other lands. And in Ohio last year, there were $6.2 million paid back to Ohioans for having energy, renewable energy infrastructure cited on their properties. So talk about a win for the family farm, talk about a win for climate change. Uh, and maybe uh, Dr. Speck getting a little bit more directly to your question, you know, and Joe touched on this, acceptance, community acceptance is becoming much more broadly um, implemented just across the US. People are no longer worried about technology, transmission lines, uh, wind farms, solar facilities being sited near their homes. In fact, a lot of people are starting to put solar panels on their houses, which I think is a great idea. Um, so, you know, I think the future really holds a lot of advancement when it does come to technology and we are seeing the public become much, much more accepting of it. And, you know, I know Melanie is a, is a commissioner and probably deals with some of these issues uh, on a pretty routine basis, certainly hears from her constituents. So I would be interested to hear too from her to see if, uh, you know, you can add some additional color to this. Well, there's certainly been a lot of change in the last 20 or 30 years. I think the thing that hits me the most is how our relationships have changed. And that goes directly to policy. You know, policy to me is all about developing relationships with constituents, developing relationships with Americans to address the issues that they have, whether, you know, in their backyard. So it's been interesting to see how social media and uh, digital communication has really changed how we interact with one another and how much closer those of us in rural areas can be to those in much larger cities. And so, you know, where we might have been flyover country before, we are very much in the thick of things when it comes to helping to influence policy at the state house, influence policy at the federal level, and then taking those things and understanding those things and applying them here to our local communities. So, you know, there's always issues. I, I see it less now, I think, than I did 10 years ago when I was working in ag policy communication and public information, but that sense of not in my backyard, which is very much probably a lot of what you see, Ellen, that um, it's, you know, we have these conflicting challenges with like, okay, I want positive environmental things, but I just don't want it to change my view or what my aesthetics out my window look like. Um, so, you know, I think those are policies and it's really just the relationships and the personal uh, feeling that people have about each of these issues and uh, being able to talk about them in a way that is not um, partisan is not um, 
so polarizing is uh, you know that that's challenging. Uh, that's the challenge, I guess, with social media. We can be closer together, but at the same time, we can feel so much farther apart because it's really easy to sit behind a computer and say really nasty, awful things to each other um, and not have productive conversation. But those tools are there to get us closer if we work at it and, and uh, develop policies together that work for everybody. Absolutely. I 100% concur on social media. It's a blessing and a curse in so many ways. Um, so let's move on to, um, to Ellen. I have a question for you. You work more on the practical side of policy. Um, so can you talk a little bit about your experience working with policy in your career? Sure. So uh, I work for a large global engineering consultancy. And so my role is not directly uh, to make or necessarily influence policy, although I do do a little bit of that being engaged with some industry organizations. But really, my role is to implement these policies and make sure that we are doing things in a way that is protecting our fish and our wildlife and our water resources that is considering the local communities like Melanie mentioned. You know, people often come to open houses and they're concerned or they're scared because they've never lived near a solar farm or an energy storage facility and they're worried that they're going to catch fire. Um, for instance, that's something that we hear a lot when it comes to energy storage. And so, you know, big part of what I do is help to educate people, help to present them with data, help to present them with facts, and also at times connect them with others, other communities, other mayors, other people who have uh, started living near some of these renewable facilities as well. Um, there's also a, a huge compliance piece to it, which is a little bit less interesting, but there's, you know, the nitty gritty of are we constructing things in a way that they're going to last for a large number of years. Uh, nobody wants to put a huge amount of investment in infrastructure of any, any size or type uh, if it's not going to last for a long time. So really my day-to-day -day is the practical application of some of these things, engineering standards, wildlife studies, um, really to ensure that going forward, we have a strong, robust grid and a strong, robust system of generation when it comes to renewable energy sources. So that, you know, when you flick the switch, the lights come on, and uh, you know, you, you're able to access hot showers and cold beers as Amory Levins once said, um, but yeah, that's what I do. Gotcha. And so I, I feel like all of the panelists here, you know, there's always that sort of move between the policy side and the application side. Um, so Joe and Melanie, how do you navigate in, in that space? Well, um, you know, from my perspective, I'm clearly uh, every day in the policy space. And so I really rely on outside experts. And, um, and that's where, you know, organizations that um, focus on advocating for, uh, for their positions really make a difference. You know, groups like Ohio Farm Bureau, um, groups like the corn growers, but also renewable energy groups. They're the ones that have the true expertise uh, and they really inform everything that we do in Washington, D.C. Um, you know, we work really, really hard not to make decisions in a vacuum uh, and to gather as much information as possible. Uh, and part of that is a political process, but also is just the, the facts on the ground. And that means we have to listen to people like Ellen, uh, who actually have built these projects and put these things together. Um, and we actually, you know, have to have to find the experts. And, you know, frankly, a lot of that expertise is at places like the College of Food and Ag Environmental Sciences. Um, we were just talking about uh, climate change and ag. Uh, what a great time to, you know, to remember that just a couple of weeks ago, Dr. Rattan Lal uh, was given, awarded the World Food Prize for his work on carbon sequestration in soils. Professor uh, here at Ohio State, um, like really cool stuff. And, you know, honestly, we turn to people like Professor Lal and to others to give us that expertise. At the county commission level, we, don't get to make policy. Um, we apply the policy in our local community. So 
it's always kind of that balance of like, I can have my philosophies and I can have theories about how I think things should operate, but it's my job to apply the Ohio Revised Code and the policies that have been established at the state level and the federal level, apply the funding sources that have been established and put them in motion uh, within the county. So while I can have opinions on policy and opinions on issues, um, I have to do that the same way that most people do is build relationships with my state rep, my state senator, with my congressman, um, with my township trustees. Um, so, you know, listening to them and then applying it and putting it into motion. I think that's kind of a misunderstood thing about county commissioners. We are the administrative, we're the executive branch of county government. And so there's three of us in my county um, to uh, just to understand Clark County a little bit. We are very balanced between urban and rural. About half of our population lives in the city of Springfield and about half of our population lives outside of the city of Springfield. We also are one of the counties in the state that has some of the most productive farmland. So we're, we have these dual priorities, you know, where economic development is important, but agriculture is incredibly important too. And that's where my background is. I want to make sure that those things are balanced and applied correctly. So there is some practical application and uh, we can make those determinations at the county level, but we don't get to say, here's the law. We get to apply that. Right. It's a listen to what Joe comes up with. And the, <laughs> the influence that Ellen has in how we put those things in motion locally. And a lot of times we'll get asked by the public, you know, what do you think about citing this new farm? I had a lot of experience working and citing large livestock farms when I was at ODA. And being the public information officer in those events, in those settings is not always the most fun place to be, <laughs> but it's managed manageable when you really believe in the process and you believe that all of these things are put into place to protect consumers and to help farmers have a transparent way of doing business in the best possible sustainable way that they can. Absolutely. And yeah. I actually, that leads, sorry, Ellen, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh, that's okay. The choice I was of just farmers. Yeah, right. I was just going to say it's such a, a good illustration of how it's so interconnected. You know, 10, 15 years ago, we didn't really ever think about siting solar panels on prime farmland. We just thought, oh, this is a great sunny spot. Of course, we'll put, you know, we'll, we'll suggest that we develop some solar in this area. And it's through working, you know, even though you're not directly making the policy, Melanie, it's through working with folks in your position where the industry has then come to learn that, in fact, this is probably not the best idea. We could probably site these panels in a better place so that we can maintain our secure uh, farmland, prime farmland, so that we have food security in our country. Uh, and then that message eventually gets back to Joe. And we say, you know, as an industry, we say, hey, we used to do it. Joe will say, well, what about this? Didn't you used to do it this way? And we'll say, yeah, we used to do it this way. But we actually talked with Melanie and a bunch of her colleagues. And we understand that's not the right way to do it anymore. Uh, so help us, you know, get some good policies or revisions to the current policies in place. So Melanie, that you, you all actually just sort of answered the question that I was going to pose to, to Melanie and then to the group, which is excellent. This is what we want you to do. Um, but Melanie, as a, as a former um, public information officer, as you mentioned, how, what do you see as the role of CFAES or other um, agricultural or environmental organizations in, in getting public, the public to understand the implications of the policies that these, that these um, folks like like Joe are putting together? How do, how do we get the public um, to sort of buy into some of the things that we're, we're developing and then implementing? Well, we can think about approaching it from getting them to buy in and marketing to them, right? But all of that getting the buy-in starts with listening. It starts with listening and engaging wherever the person is, you know, meet them where they are. So someone who's coming from a, an environmental viewpoint might be in a totally different place than I am. So just understanding that they may have concerns that based on the information they have are very valid. 
I may not think that they're valid. I may realize that they're nuts <laughs> or that they're just completely getting information from a bad place. But recognizing that, okay, I can understand that you might have that concern. Having some compassion for where they're coming from doesn't mean that I have to agree with you, but it means that I have to understand you're a human being with, with viewpoints that may differ from mine. Um, and just engaging in those conversations to develop the policy that makes sense, but maintaining a science-based approach. And that's, that's a really hard thing because people don't love science the way I do. I get real geeked out about science. I love agriculture. I get, you know, if somebody asks me about what's going on on the farm, I'm going to give you yields and all kinds of stuff that bores people to death <laughs> unless they're really into it. So we have to find ways that where we understand the mindset of people who aren't like us um, listening. And there's ways to do that. There's research and there's focus groups, but really just taking the time to listen and understand other points of view and or various points of view as we develop policies. Um, and I think you'll see the very best uh, elected officials do that in a, in a really positive way. Now, you know, I think we see on the news every day, the ones that aren't especially great at that. <laughs> um, but, you know, there are folks who are excellent at listening and they have great people in place like Joe to sit down with their constituents and share that information. Um, so yeah, public, public information background, I guess it gets, I, sometimes I mix those hats a little bit, but it's so similar communication and uh, public service that sometimes I forget which hat I'm wearing. Absolutely. So speaking of one of those big thorny issues that we all have to come together to understand, we had a question submitted by an attendee, uh, Aaron, um, and he asks, the important issue of climate change seems to um, be politically moving from a debate about um, sort of an if question into how do we actually uh, appropriately address this. Um, so as we are considering policies around food production and land use, um, what can we do? What 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 would you, uh, our panelists, um, suggest that we do um, to sort of move from this atmosphere of pinning blame or feeling blame, depending on your position, um, and really coming to sort of an understanding of how can we as a society um, work cooperatively to to solve this issue? So so what are your thoughts around this big thorny issue of climate change? Well, I'm, I'm happy to start because I, I think there's a lot of positives uh, that can come out of this. And it starts with what Melanie just said about um, listening to different perspectives and having uh, conversations rather than tweeting. Uh, you know, I, um, um, I think there's a lot of opportunity here. And um, I'll say this is a plug for some of the work that we're doing right now. Um, you know, I work for a Democrat, Debbie Sabanow on the Ag Committee. Um, she's working with a Republican, uh, Senator Mike Braun from Indiana on a bipartisan bill um, that's endorsed by the spectrum, right? From the Farm Bureau and the corn growers uh, to environmental groups like Environmental Defense Fund and the Nature Conservancy and everybody rallying around the idea that in fact, yes, agriculture can provide some solutions uh, to reduce carbon emissions and farmers should be compensated for that. Uh, and so trying to find those win-wins where we can say yes, we're going to reduce emissions, but we're also going to make sure that farmers, ranchers have an opportunity to diversify their revenue stream. And especially given the sort of price volatility that we've seen in commodity markets, um, diversifying revenue streams is exactly what I learned in my ag business class uh, as a freshman in the college. So, um, you know, those are the sorts of kind of compromises and bipartisan efforts uh, the bill is called the Growing Climate Solutions Act, if I can plug it, uh, but it's bipartisan. And that's the sort of thing that I think we need more of um, and that there's a lot of folks, despite all the rhetoric, and we're certainly in the crazy season right now before an election, but there's a lot of good bipartisan work going on uh, in places like the Senate Agriculture Committee where people are trying to find these uh, common sense bipartisan solutions. And in the Senate more broadly, there's the Climate Solutions Caucus, which is made mm -hmm. up of half Republicans and, and yep. half Democrats. You know, look, in our in my industry, we don't we don't talk about climate change as an if 
we talk about it as the big thing that we are all working towards uh, slowing or potentially solving. But when we think about our industry, we talk about it in terms of jobs and uh, in terms of, um, you know, counties and, and payments in lieu of taxes. And we talk about it in terms of some of the other just general good that we can do by, you know, of course, trying to reduce our carbon footprint, but just thinking about technology and growth and infrastructure growth in a smart way that takes into the opinion into account the opinion of many of the people who have to live near these facilities. This kind of speaks to something that concerns me sometimes too, and that is the the ownership of a, a policy or a viewpoint because we've put some sexy name on it or some creative spin on it. And so climate change became this, I don't know, something that was uh, embraced by uh, environmentalists and not embraced by conservative agriculturists, you know, over time. And so once we stop putting that label on it, then it becomes a topic that people can talk about and actually arrive at some middle ground. And it makes me think of other things that are going on in our society too. For example, the, you know, the label of Black Lives Matter, you know, you, it seems like there's this conversation around, you know, are you for it or are you against it? Well, you know, there's so much more to that conversation than are you for it or are you against it? There's there's a true underlying conversation that needs to occur uh, between people. And I think climate change is one of those things that kind of got a label and that became something that it wasn't. And it really is just about um, looking at the climate and understanding that there are changes that are happening that if there's a lot of gray in there, it's not a black or white thing. So looking at the science to guide that and looking at the science to guide our conversations instead of letting it get politically labeled in a way that keeps us from being able to arrive at some kind of common bipartisan ground. Absolutely. Um, so on a slightly lighter note, um, Joe, I wanna ask you a little bit about your family history with CFAES. Um, so the college has deep roots in your family. And can you share some thoughts about how the CFAES shaped your family and even uh, maybe your, your youth and young adulthood? Uh, absolutely. And, um, you know, like many people, uh, I wouldn't be here without the college. And I mean that literally, I, my parents met at a AGR fraternity party uh, if they're listening, uh, they're going to be very embarrassed. And I apologize, mom and dad. Um, uh, but, uh, you know, but, but growing up, you know, 4-H, which we all know, um, you know, doesn't exist without the college, uh, was an integral part of my life. That's, that's how, and, and Melanie knows, uh, A.B. Graham High School, probably not too far away from uh, where Melanie is, um, you know, the birthplace of 4-H in America. Um, like, you know, I got to know the kids in the community because we would go to the local uh, Miami Valley producers MVP 4-H club meetings. Uh, I got to know kids, you know, in Western Ohio because we would go to camp at uh, 4-H Camp Clifton. Um, and that's all because of the college and all of the fantastic 4-H extension educators out there. Um, and so that's, you know, it's, it's, it's part of who I am. Uh, and so uh, I can't speak enough, not only thank you for introducing my parents, but also, um, you know, not only it didn't just occur to me that Ohio State and the college was such an important place uh, my freshman year when I got to, uh, to campus. Um, I knew that because of the local 4-H agents um, and how important that was for me growing up. Anyone else have a CFAS story? That's interesting, Joe. I, my parents actually met through AGS. I'm guessing around the same time your parents. <laughs> and I'm one of four kids um, born to my Ohio State graduate parents. And all four of us have our undergrad degrees from Ohio State, three out of four in the College of Food Ag and Environmental Sciences. And uh, up until my brother went to law school, we had a perfect streak of being all Ohio State University graduates. He went to Capitol for a year and decided he was gonna to go to the best law school that he could get into. Um, this is a guy with an animal science degree from Ohio State. And he went to that school up north and ruined it for all of us. 
but it's pretty decent law school. There is that. And he wow. is an, an environmental attorney now too, business attorney. That's but great. He, I have. He does share with us that when he went to his first football game up there and they played Notre Dame, he stood in the stands and said to himself, I don't know which one of these schools I hate more. <laughs> Ellen, how about you? Uh, I have the opposite story. I grew up in Pennsylvania. I was an out of state student and uh, went to, or have a, have a very Penn State cent alumni centric family. And uh, I was the first one in my family to make the right call and come to Ohio State. I, I have subsequently recruited my little sister. She graduated from uh, the College of Arts with a, a Bachelor's of Fine Arts degree. And now my brother lives in Hubbard, Ohio and has four girls. And I have already started the recruitment process uh, so hopefully we'll have four more Buckeye alums here in the next, you know, 12 to 18 years. That's what we like to hear. You got to start early. You really, yep. um, let's see here. Okay. So here's another question from an audience member. And I'm very excited about this one because this involves students. Um, so can you each please share your thoughts on how you would advise current students interested in careers in environmental policy? Um, to get started in building networks and what type of experience or organization memberships would be beneficial for them to get started? Boy, I have lots of thoughts on that. Um, I, I would first say learn as much as you can. Uh, take as many different classes as you can because as you've heard from all of us here, environmental policy touches so many different aspects of life in general on this planet. Uh, and so just focusing really narrowly on a subject sometimes does not allow you to have the perspective that you really need to be effective at creating or implementing different policies that do the greatest amount of good. Uh, there is a program that I attended while I was at Ohio State called the John Glenn Institute. Uh, it was really important in my career progression. You go, it's, a, it's an externship where you go to DC for uh, a semester and you work a couple of days a week. Uh, I worked for the US EPA in the Division of Wetlands. Um, and then you take courses for a number of days a week. So that gives you great exposure. It allows you to live in DC. You're having all of these great conversations and interactions and you know, learning if you want to be engaged in the federal policy and, and do some of the things that Joe is doing. Uh, so that's, that's just one thing. There's so many others out there. I'm sure Melanie and Joe, you guys have great advice too. Internships jump to my mind, you know, just having a chance to even do a volunteer internship. My very first internship was as a freshman at Ohio State. I did a volunteer internship with the uh, Department of Communications and Technology or section of communication technology within the college at that time. And I stayed there and progressed through before I had graduated. I was filling in for someone who was on sabbatical as an associate editor and interned at a local television station, learning about journalism because I thought that that's what I wanted to do and then went more of the PR and policy route. Um, but internships can, they can fill your time. They can give you men, you know, mentors that might be around your entire career. Um, and I'm amazed how many interns that I've invested my time in mentoring who have gone on to be far more successful than me. I've got a former intern that's a, a content advisor at Facebook and one that is the PR um, and she's a graduate of the college too, uh, uh, the PR director at Certified Angus Beef. And, you know, so I get so much out of helping people through those internships. You know, I can't say enough about the opportunity for a student to take advantage of that too. And it just transitions you right into your lifelong career. It also gives you a view of what you might not want to do before you actually accept a job in something that you might not want to do. Absolutely. Joe, what are your thoughts? Uh, I, I agree with I agree with everything that everybody said. I wanted to be a Glenn Fellow and go to DC, and they wouldn't let me in. Uh, and so, uh, so I guess now, uh, but I do now in the I think they're called the Washington Academic uh, Internship Program now. 
uh, but now I get to talk to the class uh, almost every year um, that they're in DC, and it's an it's one of my absolute favorite days of the year when uh, uh, the the Ohio State students come in. Um, but I, I think that I agree with everything that Melanie and Ellen just said. I would just say that how important it is to get out of your dorm room and go, uh, you know, stretch your limits a little bit, you know, whether it's a study abroad, whether it's going to organizational meetings that maybe, you know, um, you know, you're not as familiar with. Um, certainly doing things, uh, you know, I, my first couple of years, I really focused on doing things uh, within the college. Uh, and then the last couple of years of college, I spent a lot of time on main campus and main campus student organizations. And all that was just so amazing to meet so many interesting people that I'm still in touch with today. So uh, get out of the dorm room and, uh, and, and do something. Sounds like good advice to me. Um, Ellen, I, I wanna ask you a question and part of this question came from an audience member. Um, so as a member of the American Wind Energy Association Board, would you take a moment to reflect on the industry's development across the country? And specifically, um, our audience member Marilyn would like to know if you are involved in the wind farm proposed for Lake Erie. Oh, that's that's a good question. And that, that touches on offshore wind, which I haven't talked about very much uh, on this call because it's it's still a fairly nascent industry in the US. So yes, to address your, your first part of this, I mean, I work coast to coast, there's renewable energy being developed everywhere. Uh, that's because there's people everywhere and electricity load everywhere. Uh, and so uh, people, you know, people really want a solution that is low carbon or carbon free, you probably see on your uh, energy bills, you probably have the option to select some sort of green option, or I think out here in Oregon, it's called the blue sky option uh, within my utility. But you know, it's, it's, a, it's an issue that has become important in many places. Now we cite these facilities where the resource is good. So just because you're really pro wind or solar doesn't necessarily mean that you can have a facility in your community. Um, but there are, you know, there are lots of developments. There's developments in every single state in the US. And now, like you said, there are developments happening in offshore areas. Uh, we're able to install really big machines that generate a ton of electricity. And like Melanie said, they don't bug the people who aren't necessarily into seeing them or having them in their communities because uh, they're far, far offshore. Um, so there's lots of potential benefits there. It's harder to construct them in the offshore environment. You need much longer transmission cables. So there's some challenges as well, for sure. Uh, I've been a little bit involved and my organization has been a little bit involved in the project up in Lake Erie. There's a lot of technical studies that go into things like that. So one thing, one study that we did that I thought was very interesting uh, was that we looked at the ice flow in Lake Erie to understand if ice was going to be hitting into these turbines uh, over and over again every year and if there would be some sort of effect on their foundation. So, you know, everything from those little nitty gritty details have to really be understood uh, to ensure that we're installing these large machines in a safe and long lasting way. Absolutely. Just a, another small issue that we're dealing with, right? Yeah, right. So I have one, uh, one final question from the audience and our audience member, um, Jeff, wants to know, in a world flooded with text messages and tweets, can you talk a little bit about the importance of still being able to write and translate information to the audience, given how much crosstalk there tends to be um, between a lot of the groups that we've talked about today? And, and Melanie, I might actually ask you to kick this one off with your communication background. Okay. Well. So I subscribe to the philosophy that communication is a science, not an art. It's not about being a people person. It's not about being well-spoken or just waking up one day and like, oh yeah, I'm just a grammar person or something. It is a science and that's a science that can be learned and improved upon infinitesimally. You can get better and better and better at being a good communicator. And to me, and I learned this in AgCom, communication is the science of creating meaning. I'm gonna repeat that, the science of creating meaning. 
I'm not successful as a communicator unless I've created meaning for you. I'm not successful in helping people understand policy if I haven't created meaning for you. So I can talk until I'm blue in the face about or crosstalk or tweet or whatever about what I think you should know about what I want you to know. But if it never creates any meaning for you, it's pointless. So that's what I would say is just using the science to understand different viewpoints, to speak to the reptilian brain, to really truly drive at what's important instead of just talking around issues, uh, really truly creating meaning for that other person. And you do that by having a two-way interaction, not just speaking at people, speaking with them. Mm -hmm. And the root of being able to speak with people is having a relationship building relationships and not relying on the platform or the tool to create that relationship for you, but actually building meaning between two parties to develop understanding between them. So that's my little lecture for the day on communication. All right. I, I just want to say, I couldn't agree more than what Melanie just said. And um, one of my jobs is to um, try to craft bipartisan legislation, try to find compromise among groups that disagree um, or they just see the world differently. And, you know, I've had the chance to work on some really fun issues like the last farm bill, um, which touches all sorts of parts of our food and farming system. But to Melanie's point, um, none of that would have happened without individuals in a room trying to understand each other better, understand where their bosses and their constituencies come from and trying to find compromise. And none of that happened. Um, it, it frankly, you know, a lot of it doesn't happen over email. It certainly didn't happen over tweet. It happened with warm bodies in a conference room, very dark, dingy conference room, uh, trying to, to, to understand each other and find solutions. Uh, and it's, it's hard work and it's certainly harder now when we can't be in person a lot of the times. Um, but, but that's the way that we get bipartisan bills done uh, in the Senate is you got to have people with relationships in a room together uh, trying to figure it out. Oh, I couldn't agree more with what both of you have said. And, and Melanie also said something brilliant earlier on, and that is that you have to listen to people. You really have to be driven by the listening. And when you're tweeting uh, or putting things out there in short performance type blurbs, you know, there's no listening. And when there's no listening, there's no empathy. And when there's no empathy, then there's no collaborative solutions. So I totally agree with what everyone says. Um, you know, there's, I think that empathy piece too, just to underscore it a little bit more is so important because you can present the science to people and they can still be really concerned. I see it in my work when we talk about wind turbines and the sound that they produce. You know, we do studies all the time. There's so many, there's, there's thousands, tens, hundreds of thousands of turbines installed in the U.S. We know what they sound like. We know how far away they need to be from a house so that you're going to hear it. And, you know, we do these really sophisticated reports where we model and we have all this data and we take measurements and we present it to the public. And inevitably there's the the new mom who's sleep deprived, who's worried that it's going to keep her kids up at night, or, you know, there's all sorts of different uh, potential life situations that cause people to be concerned. And I think really to get to that place where you can have good dialogue, good collaboration, really understand the other person, it, you have to be driven by empathy. And Twitter just does not facilitate that. I think that is a very, very salient point right now. Um, so I just wanna give all three of you an opportunity to sort of briefly sum up your thoughts and maybe if there was anything that we weren't able to touch on in the last hour to, to add some, some parting thoughts um, here before we, before we head out. Um, so first of all, you know, why is it important to support the next generation of CFAES students, maybe specifically those who are involved or interested in policy? And, uh, and what else would you like to, to say to kind of wrap up our discussion? And uh, Melanie will actually kick it off with you. So I think it's important to help 
continue to get younger folks, students, you know, even people um, who are well into their careers involved in policy. Um, it's not always interesting to everybody. And I think as time goes on, maybe as you develop in your career, it can become more interesting. Maybe it's because of background that you need to have for work that you do. And um, it's politics have changed in the last four years. When I ran for county commission, um, it was a completely different animal than it is today. And I would encourage people to really think about that there are human beings serving their communities in these roles. It's not just, um, you know, people who are out for fame or fortune. I mean, certainly I'm not getting rich being a um, local elected official, um, but I am compensated for my time to serve my community in a way that I think has a pretty big impact. So that's one thing that I would just encourage um, the building people up to try to serve in these opportunities and roles. You can do that through volunteer boards. You can do that through running for township trustee. You can run for county commission. You can run for the state house. You can run for Congress. I can't believe how many times, even my son told me like, mom, you should run for president. Heck no. I can't imagine. <laughs> I can't imagine the- uh, I vote for you. I think you should do it. <laughs> I think it's stressful enough being a, a local, you know, county elected official, but uh, you know, that's, that's a pretty big vote of confidence for my 15 year old. Um, but, you know, we really do need to continue to involve younger folks in policy discussions, what they want for the future and get them involved in those things and provide the support network that they need to not be afraid to share that as a career goal or an interest because it's, it's a tough environment to be in right now, um, both in this, you know, think about lots of different things people don't maybe want to do right now, like policing or politics. It's, you know, those can be ugly, but it's not always that way. It can be really rewarding and a wonderful way to help your community if you can be inspired and mentored to do that. I think that's a great message. Ellen? Yeah, so I just want to first thank Dr. Specht and uh, Amy Jo and everyone else who made this happen and who invited us and, and Joe and Melanie for the good discussion over the last hour. I think to this for the students out there and, and thinking about the next generation of students, you know, I think it's just really important that people be open to learning as much as they can, exploring as many different topics as they potentially can. Uh, I knew as a student that I wanted to do something technical. I actually took a lot of soil chemistry classes, shout out to Professor Basta, like I had a wonderful time in my soil science courses and I thought I was going to go clean up super fun sites and this renewable energy thing just sort of came across my desk and it was fascinating and I feel like I get to help people and I get to protect the environment and I get to uh, flex those technical muscles as well. So I would say just be open. You know, life doesn't always pan out exactly how you want it potentially or how you planned it, but it can still be really wonderful. And Joe. Well, two quick thoughts. Um, first, uh, I want to second what Melanie said about public service. And it doesn't matter if you're a Republican, you're a Democrat, if you hate politics, um, there's a role for everyone in public service. And, and it doesn't mean you have to be an elected official or go to Washington, DC. You can, um, you know, like Ellen does, she serves on the, her, the board of her trade association to help make public policy better. Um, and, and it's just so important. And I'm just such a fan of, of people finding the way that they can be involved in their communities and their country through public service. The second thing I would say to students uh, is, is how an amazing resource the college is and the faculty that we have access to. And I just wanna say, uh, when I talked to other people outside of the college who went to Ohio State and they said, oh, you know, I never really got to know any of my professors. And I said, I have all of these folks that are on a first name basis and people, I have to, I have to say, Bernie Irvin, my, my professor at AggieCon, Amazing, Carl Zuloff. I read an, we were on an email chain this morning talking about the next farm bill with Dr. Zuloff. Just amazing people that um, have made such an incredible difference in my life. And I don't think that folks realize how lucky we are uh, in the college to have access to those faculty members. Thank you all. 
Um, so as we wrap up this, uh, this session of the CFAES Time and Change Alumni Series, I'd first like to thank our panelists, Ellen, Joe, and Melanie for serving on our panel today. We appreciate you sharing your experiences. This has really been great. Um, and your interest in and affection for the college is going to help us better serve our current and future generations of food, agricultural, and environmental leaders. So you guys are all integral in that. So once this webinar concludes, uh, just a couple minutes late, um, you will be asked to take a survey. Please provide feedback about your experience today so that we can improve future webinars. You will also receive a follow-up message with the recording of today's session. Thank you again to our panelists and to our audience for joining us today. We hope to see you at our next webinar, and until then, stay safe and go Bucks.